Let's go to one of the reasons that have been cited for the growth of the Islamic State, not the Muslim community in France. The Guardian reported Wednesday that four former Air Force drone operators have written an open letter to Barack Obama warning that the program of targeted killings by drones has become a major driving force for ISIS and other terrorist groups. They write, quote, the innocent civilians we were killing only fueled the feelings of hatred that ignited terrorism and groups like ISIS, while all also serving as a fundamental recruitment tool similar to Guantanamo Bay. Glenn Greenwald, could you respond to that? It's amazing how we just refuse to learn this lesson. Um, I mean, obviously, there are some differences between ISIS and al-Qaeda, but there's many, many more similarities than differences. And one of the things that we should have learned and that a lot of people have learned, including not just, you know, left-wing activists or, or um, independent journalists, but even think tanks and, and even the Rumsfeld Pentagon commissioned a study finding this, that what fuels and strengthens terrorist organizations is resentment toward the United States as a result of the policies that we engage in, the actions that we engage in, in that part of the world. Yemen is probably the best example. If you talk to Yemenis, what they will tell you is, is that there was no al-Qaeda in Yemen. Or very little al-Qaeda in Yemen, very weak and very just the presence was marginal and negligible prior to the U.S. escalating its drone campaign in 2009, 2010, and killing huge numbers of civilians, which is what drove Yemenis into the arms of al-Qaeda and strengthened al-Qaeda to become al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. And so, of course, you will always have violent extremists. We have them in the United States, as, as Amy mentioned earlier, you know, people who are like Timothy McVeigh, anti-government extremist or Christian extremist who kill abortion uh, doctors or white supremacists who go into a church in Charleston and, and shoot up um, people on a church for no reason other than hatred of their race. So you're always going to have violent extremists. You can't eliminate that. We're always going to have ISIS. You can't eliminate that. The question then becomes, how do you avoid giving them an infrastructure of support and fueling and strengthening the uh, willingness of people to, to, to run into their arms. Um, and so much of what we're doing, from dropping bombs on civilians and virtually, you know, in multiple countries in that region, to pouring weapons and money into that region that end up in the hands of ISIS, um, is absolutely strengthening them. And as these four Air Force whistleblowers said this morning, the, the Obama drone campaign is a major recruitment tool for ISIS because people in that region constantly see— just just like we just saw in Paris, they constantly see images of dead women and children and innocent men at the hands of the United States government. And just like we have anger toward ISIS when we see that and want to do violence to them, the people in that part of the world who see images of our victims want to do that as well to us. And running into the arms of ISIS is a natural thing for them to do. Glenn Greenwald, what about if the media did not see war as an option? So, for example, you have these horrific attacks in Paris. The immediate response is the pummeling of Raqqa. Um, yes, they say it's the headquarters of the Islamic State. It's got hundreds of thousands of civilians. France pummels it. The U.S. pummels it. Russia pummels it. Where are the questions in the media about the civilian death toll? And then the people, of course, fleeing that hellhole will be stopped from resettling anywhere, as we see from the United States to Europe. So that question of broadening the discussion to peaceful options, clearly war has not worked for well over 14 years now. Taliban controls more of Afghanistan than it did before the U.S. invaded. I mean, Afghanistan is the perfect example, Amy, which is, you know, if you go back and listen to what American political leaders and both parties and journalists and, and pretty much the entire country, I mean, 90 percent of the American population supported the war in Afghanistan. I mean, there were a good number of people who didn't, but overwhelmingly people did. Um, what everybody was saying at that time was they were speaking out of rage and anger and hatred and disgust for the Taliban, for their involvement or perceived involvement or responsibility for the 9-11 attacks. And the idea was, we're going to go to Afghanistan. Afghanistan, and we're going to obliterate the Taliban. We're going to basically just bomb them out of existence. Um, and the Bush administration had a completely free hand, cheered on by the media and the overwhelming majority of the American population, to do exactly that. And they tried. And yet, as you just said, 13 years later, the Taliban is stronger than ever, because you cannot 
uh, do that. All you end up doing um, is turning the people of Afghanistan against you and therefore driving them into the arms of the Taliban. We just won't learn that lesson. And the reason we won't learn that lesson is twofold. Number one is a lot of what is being stoked are really potent instincts in, in human nature, our tribalistic instinct, our desire for vengeance, our desire to otherize people and then destroy them. And so when you see carnage in Paris, I'm sure it's true for you. I know it's true for me. All of us have that impulse to say the people who did this are monsters and, and we want to destroy them. Um, but we, as human beings, have not only impulse, we also have reason. And the purpose of our reason is to control our instincts and impulses. We don't just act by in instinct and impulse. If we did, we'd be the lowest level animals. Um, but the media is trying to stoke that id part of our brain, um, and so is the government, to just focus on vengeance and focus on a desire to obliterate, even when it's not in our interest to do so. And then the second reason is, you know, the American media benefits immensely from war. A um, huge number of people watch CNN and, and MSNBC when there are wars. Um, they get to go to war zones and dress up as soldiers, you know, with, with, with camouflage flax, and they embed with the American media. It's exciting for them. They win awards as part of their career. They feel nationalistic. They feel like they have purpose. Um, telling people that they're part of a civilization war and fighting for freedom and democracy, that makes people feel really good, especially journalists. Um, and so journalists are hungry for war. You could ba basically see them drooling in that press conference they did with Obama a few days ago where they tried to badger him into sending ground troops into Syria. Um, so all of these emotions and all of these instincts and all of these really ignominious impulses are combining into this really toxic brew um, that we've seen many times in the U.S. over the last several, you know, since 9-11, but I don't think we have seen it quite as potently um, since 2002 or 2003, and it's amazing to watch everything just repeat itself. Just to clarify, uh, on the issue of the Taliban, the, uh, the Taliban control more of the country now than right after the U.S. invaded, when supposedly the U.S. was going to uh, take charge and force the Taliban out. Nermeen. Yeah, Glenn Greenwald, uh, talking about the increasing militarization of the conflict, you've spoken of the effects of pouring uh, so many weapons into the region. And your recent article, one of your recent articles, is headlined, Stock Prices of Weapons Manufacturers Soaring Since the Paris Attack. So could you talk about what you found, what arms manufacturers and where are increasing their arms sales? It was really, it was amazing. Uh, the, the Paris attacks happened on Friday night, last Friday night. So the markets obviously weren't open over the weekend. They opened first thing in the morning, Monday. Instantly, if you look at the charts of the stock prices of the leading weapons manufacturers, not only in the United States, but also in France, there was a massive leap the minute the markets opened. It was like buyers were, investors were frothing at the mouth to buy the stock of the leading arms manufacturers, such as Boeing, uh, General Dynamics, Raytheon, um, and then in, in, in France, uh, the leading one is Thale, the Thales is, is the French pronunciation, I believe. Um, and, and in each case, um, you see this in straight up vertical line beginning right at the beginning of the day and then throughout the day the stock prices continue to increase from anywhere to three to five to six percent um, and then the following day in, in a lot of cases it continued even as the rest of the market was basically flat or up very very slightly there was a huge gap between the weapons manufacturers stock prices and, and the rest of the market and the reason is obvious which is every time there's a terrorist attack western leaders exploit that attack to do more war, as Amy was just saying, um, which in turn means they transfer huge amounts of American taxpayer money and the taxpayer uh, money in France and, and Great Britain to these corporations that sell arms. Um, and so investors are fully aware that the main people who are going to benefit from this escalation as a result of Paris um, are not the American people or the people of the West, certainly not the people of Syria. Um, it's essentially the military uh, industrial complex that is going to profit greatly. You talk about the weapons manufacturers. What about the countries? If you can, we can end on Saudi Arabia, and we only have 30 seconds. U.S. just signing one uh, massive arms deal after another with Saudi Arabia. 
It's the weirdest part of the, the war on terror, which is that there's one country basically most identified with the 9-11 attacks and the ideology that drove it, and that happens to be the second closest ally of the United States in that region, which is Saudi Arabia. And they not only were responsible for lots of parts of al-Qaeda, but are funding in lots of different ways ISIS as well, and yet we continue to hug them while waging war in countries that have never had anything to do with attacks on our country. Glenn Greenwald, we want to thank you for being with us, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist. We will link to your pieces at The Intercept, among them New York Times editorial slams disgraceful CIA exploitation of Paris attacks, but submissive media role is key.